Today, I'm going to step you through the process of implementing the 1.7 hotfix for Survival Game Kit. I will be basing this on my project of Advanced Locomotion and Survival Game Kit. So if you've been following those tutorials, I started those in the 1.63 version. So my one that I've been basing everything off of is currently 1.63. Today, I'm going to take you to upgrading that to 1.7. If you already are on 1.7, which is a a very good possibility depending on when you implemented and did my tutorial uh, that will be determining which one of these videos you will want to follow so if you look in the world you will see that there is some text over here that says survival game kit and then a version number you will need to go check your version number to make sure that you're not already on 1.7 or you could be on 1.71 something newer and so make sure that you check this first and make sure that to ensure that this is a relevant video for you to actually work through. You may already have all these features implemented. So if you do, go ahead and skip this video. I'm going to release one for each version. So uh, at the time of this recording, there's a 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, and a 1.74 that he's just releasing now. So what I'll be doing is just in this one will be 1.7. Do another video after this just that next version. So you can pick which one is relevant and only do the ones that apply to the one that you're upgrading. At the end of the video, I'll show you how to update your text here. We'll put it on the correct version number and that will help you track. So you always know where you're at. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing that you'll look at is go ahead and pull up this text that has all the notes. So this is the instructions from the developer of the survival game kit, stepping you through each of these. And we'll be following each of these, but you can pull it up on your screen. If you have a second screen, watch the video on the other one, or just have this on the side where you can kind of follow along and, and see what I'm doing along the way. I'll pull this to the side for now. And so I will have it on my other screen and I'll be referencing that throughout. So the first one that we'll want to do is to allow first person ADS from third person. So this is going to put a checkbox where you can pretty much not allow someone to go into that first person view when they're in third person. So when uh, in my fixes, I actually have implement, implemented a different double click. So if you double right click, it will take you into that first person view aiming down the sights of the gun. Uh, it, this will prevent that from happening. So let's go ahead and open up the player inventory component. You should be inside of showcase here on the left hand side there's content and what we want to do is in the filters type player inventory component you'll see it right here player inventory component not the building component go ahead and open that up and in this on the left hand side where it says variables you want to click the plus there and we want to create a variable called allow FP space ADS from TP. So you can have the spaces in there because of, uh, because of there's capitalization. That's not just the first letter of each word. This is not going to be as good when you make it all one string. If what unreal does is if you put a first letter as a capital, it'll automatically put a space like this one right here is master character. And there's actually one word. But when, when you look at it here in Unreal, it makes it as a space. Actually, this one does, but let's go ahead and take it away. So I've renamed that variable to have master character, all one word, just have capital letters and see how Unreal has made a space in that location. Well, if I did that with this new variable that I created, it would have either not spaces in places it should, or it would have weird spaces. So we're going in for this one just because of the name at, you know, the name isn't super important. If you wanted to, if that bugs you and you wanted to name it something different, you just need to remember what it is, but I do recommend following these just in case in future releases, you ever copy and paste code, or you're following other instructions that you know, uh, what this is referring to. We need to compile because on this variable, we need to set it to true first. 
because by default, you do want to allow first person from third person. That will be the existing uh, before you make this change. That's how it would have been operating before. And so we want to allow that to continue to happen. And then you can uncheck that if you ever want to disallow it. So for now, let's go ahead and check that box. And then we need to go into the enter aimed section. So in the upper left here under search, type enter aimed. And then you'll see here a graph for that go ahead and open it up. And then we need to find where it says set ADS and that's towards the end here. So here is set ADS. Go and expand that out and we need some room for this set first person in master character, because we're going to have some things that are kind of working around this. So let's go ahead and drag all the way from that first person in master character over, drag it to the right about that far. And now what we want to do is get the reference for that variable we just made. You can either on the left, band it out so you can see it and drag it out, or you could right click and do a search for get allow and then yeah, right. So from this variable, we need to do a branch. So from the set, I'm going to drag off of that and type branch. Then I'll connect these two together. Now what we want to do is just do a reroute node for when this is false, because we don't want this to this part right here where it puts you into first person. This is the only thing we don't want running if, if you're not allowing that. So from false, drag that over to the ADS and then double click on the line so that we can do a reroute node. There, so now that lets us reroute, but what we want to do is kind of bring this back in. I like to have everything kind of tight and close and not all spaced out. So I'm just going to clean this up as we go. Make this look nice. And that will allow you to not have that happen every time when you double right click. All right, very good. So. That was pretty simple. Just a quick little change. You now have a checkbox. Uh, another thing that we'll want to do here is actually change it to hide the, uh, the crosshair when you're in first person. We just need to tweak that setting a little bit. So what we'll want to do for this is to still in this inventory HUD. Uh, actually, we want to be in the inventory HUD. We're still working the inventory, but we need to open up the display. So what you can do is on the main screen and content, under filters, type inventory HUD, all one word. You'll see that is the only option that comes up. And then inside of the graph, we'll bring up the blueprints. You need to go to the search on the upper left and do set crosshair, and then you'll see crosshair visibility. Now we just need to add something at the end here uh, because depending on whether or not you're in the third person camera versus the first person camera, we want that crosshair to hide. And here it's ADS that it's doing. We're going to keep there is player at ADS, but we're going to put in one more check after this. So go and expand to the right so that the comment box is bigger. You can drag down a little bit as well. And from, from this branch, uh, you could move this down below because we're going to put some code above it. And then the top one that says hidden, you can drag that to the right more. From the true of the existing branch, make another branch, drag that off, create another branch. It's going to need to be a little bit to the right because we need to tell it what it's checking for. So right click and search for player inventory. And you'll see the player in get player inventory component. Go ahead and click that. And then drag off of that for camera view, get camera view. Okay. So we're, we're checking with the inventory component. We're going to get the camera view and we want to see if it's equal. So type equal equals, you'll see an equal enum. We want that to be the third person camera. So see here, I'm still going to type for space. I'm just going to space this out a little bit more. Yeah, because we can have, we can take up all this room if we want to. Okay, so it's now saying, is this in the third person camera view? 
if it is, we want the, this is going to be wrong. Let's make a copy of it really quick though. So select it in control C and control V. And then on false, drag it there. That's going to be hidden. The true, we want to be visible. So if you're in third person camera view, we want the crosshair to be visible. So that way uh, it shows up when you're in third person, when you're not in third person, so you are actually in first person. Uh, you do that double right click, then it will show hidden. So that should take care of allowing the FP ADS settings. So we can go on to the next one. You can go ahead and close out of that one and then go to the add manual key, save key shortcut. And this is going to, going to allow you to press a key and it will do a manual save of the game. You may not be taking advantage of this yet. This isn't a totally essential one, but I would recommend that you implement something, at least most of the code, you could take away the key calling it, uh, but that way you match the 1.7 and if you ever see fixes in the future and things like that, well, you may have code missing. I mean, if you, if you are really comfortable, you can leave it out of here, but let's go ahead and implement this and you're welcome to do it as well. Now, if you're following along and you don't have ALS, because this, the patches and things that I'm doing will work for ALS and will work if you don't have ALS. Uh, if you do have ALS, You'll, we'll follow the instructions exactly as I'm getting ready to do them. But if you don't, you just need to go to under survival game kit, blueprints, uh, take away the filter there, characters. You're going to be working in this survival character. Uh, that's only if you just have the survival game kit. But if you're working in ALS, let's go to advanced locomotion V3 and you followed my tutorial before. Go to blueprints under ALS and we're going to select the ALS based character. So now what we want to do is in the event graph, so just double click the event graph on the left. We're going to add a new section. We can go ahead and add this. We can add it uh, just under left mouse here. That's, it'll be fine with us. So just in a, a new area of this blue section, we need to create a custom event and this custom event it's going to be an execute on the server. So there will be a form of re replication with it. So to start, just right click and we'll type custom event. The add custom event there. We'll zoom in a little bit so it's easy. And then for the name, call it server save game. Uh, from the drop down but run on server. And you'll see that this makes it execute on server. And if you're following along with the pictures, uh, you'll see that that matches. Uh, I would check reliable. It always seems to, uh, the fuse seems to like reliable in there. And now what we want to do is drag off of server save game and do a get all actors of class. And this is going to search for the save game component. So what we want to do is BP inventory save system. So we'll hit the drop down, search for that BP inventory save system. And this is going to find the save that's in the level, uh, because this, uh, this does exist and it controls all the saves and we just need to get that. So now drag off of out actors and type a get do a get copy from this. We're going to drag off of the get and we're going to do a run auto save an existing blueprint. So that takes care of the initial section, but nothing is calling this at the moment. Let's go ahead and do a quick comment around this. So highlight all of that that we just created. Hit C. We'll just call this server save game. This will just help us to remember what all of this section is doing. Below it, let's create another uh, reference. So right click and type input because we're going to, so just for this one, the demo, we're going to do the letter K. You can drag down until you find the letter K. If you have something already at this, you can choose any other input. It just needs to be something unique. And from the press, let's search for server save game. 
And all that is doing is calling that one we have above. Make a little comment around this, highlight it all, hit C, and just do save game. Now in the game, whenever I hit A, it's going to do a manual save. Uh, and I'm not personally at the moment how it is. Uh, we're not loading initial saves at the beginning of the game, but we could easily turn that on and make that happen. All right, so if you're following along, you should be able to close all of those relating to the save game. And now let's move on to add require fuel option to convert component. Now, this was a request that came out of the uh, Discord. And it was someone wanting to create something that was similar to the maybe the fireplace or the furnace, but didn't require fuel because there are situations where maybe you would want to generate objects based on uh, items in your inventory. So you're adding ingredients, but you don't want to always have a fuel there. You just want to make them similar to a, a workbench, but you want them to generate something based on items. So this is something that was added to be able to do that. We need to go back to showcase, going to do a save all really quick. We made a lot of changes just in case the engine crashes or something happens. We want to make sure we've saved all the changes up to this point. Now, right click on content, do a quick fix up redirectors, should be good. Uh, and then search under filters. We want BP underscore convert inventory component. Double click that. And then we'll go to the burn fuel section. So in the upper left here, just type burn fuel. And you'll see it under functions. Go ahead and double click that. And we're going to be adding something right before the very initial entry of this. So drag that out just a bit. We're going to make room for a branch here. So drag off of burn fuel, type branch. What we need to do is create a variable called require fuel. So under variables, pick uh, the plus there and type require fuel. We can leave it as unchecked and then drag that require fuel right to the condition. And you'll see adds it right there. Now we need to bypass some things if you don't want to require fuel because all of this code here is doing everything with the fuel slots. And what we want to do is bypass all that and come right here to this set when you don't require fuel. So from false, drag all the way to set switched on the set there. And then double click on the line. Let's just reroute it so it looks better. Things crossing all over. It's easier to read when you have straight lines here. So now uh, require fuel if it doesn't, bypasses and continues to create things in the in the what you know with the equivalent of a furnace without having a fuel. So we still need to do another check here. So to do this, we'll need to do the update fuel burn. And this is also going to be in the same component that we're in right now, but in the upper left, search for update fuel burn, double click that. Once again, we're going to add something to the beginning of this. We're just going to do a quick check So drag out, move the entry to the left a little bit, dra uh, drag to the right from the uh, node there and do a branch. We already have the existing one that we need. Either you could remove this search and your variables and find it there, or you could drag from the condition, just type require fuel. So now it's saying, do you require fuel? If that's true, you go here. If it's false, we need to continue. So we need to still return a node there. So I'm going to pick this one that's currently check true at the end of is all spurning stop. I'm going to hit control C there. I'm going to control V it right below that branch I created. Let's connect it up and you just make sure if you copied one of those, that that is checked. And so this will skip all the fuel burning process, but still say that it's successful. It'll return that 
this did happen successfully. Kind of bypasses it a little bit. Well, there is something in the HUD referring to fuel. And so we need to remove this because it's going to just be an option. It doesn't make sense if you if it's not something that requires fuel. So we need to go to the convert widget. So on the showcase there, on the left-hand side, search for convert. Oops, sorry. In the uh, filters, make sure you're on content. And in the filters, search for convert widget. I already have it typed in here. So it's this BP convert widget. Double click that. And then select the fuel section. So on the designer, you'll see fuel. Click it so it has this nice green bar around it. And then scroll down where you see you should see visibility. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is making it so that this disappears when we're not, when we don't have uh, a fuel to burn, when it's not requiring a fuel. We want it to be to where this moves up and it just says converting and contents. So in the visibility, hit the little down arrow by the bind and hit create binding. Now going to create a new one for us. We're going to put some blueprints in here to handle this. And it will just hide that when it's not needed. First, we need the inventory component. So do a right click, do a get inventory component. And then we need to refer to the storage component. So do a get storage component. And from this, we're going to cast to the convert inventory component. So drag off and do a cast to and select that convert inventory component. What I want to do is connect this in. So I'm going to control click and drag to the right side of that from the visibility zero and then connect that back up just as you see. Now from this cast, we need to refer to the component that it's now has. And we need to find the number of fuel slots. So drag off of the as BP convert inventory component and choose and type in fuel slots. We need to do a get fuel slots. And that will be the variable that's below. Now from this fuel slot, drag off and do a greater than and make sure it's integer greater than integer, not an equals to. We need to make sure that there's more than one fuel slot. So if there's zero fuel slots, now let's do a branch, actually do something with that information. So drag off and do a branch, connect that up. And now what we do is if there are fuel slots, we want that node. So the fuel word here to be visible. Well, if it's not, go and do a control C on this return node, control V it, put the false to that one and then put flaps. So if it's not visible or if it's not, there's no fuel slots, then it's not going to be visible. Of course, now what we want to do is just cast failed. If, if for some reason it can't find this, we still want it to operate as normal. We don't want everything to break. We're going to drag that to the return node of visible and then just clean this up a little bit. So it goes around it. So this will now hide this fuel text whenever we do not have fuel slots. Okay, so now uh, you can go ahead and close out of that. We've completed that section of the tutorial of the uh, do-it-yourself guide. Go ahead and save really quick. I'm going to close all these other windows. Do a quick fix up redirectors. Okay, good on that. He's added a jump cooldown. So for this, we will need to go ahead and get into the. Well, if you're on just survival game kit survival game character, the survival character, which is in the blueprints under survival game kit characters. Uh, or if you're doing it based on my tutorial of ALS and survival game kit, let's go ahead and go to advanced locomotion V3 and then blueprints. We'll open back up that ALS based character. And then we want to search on the upper left or actually the left. We want to search under my blueprints for is inventory open. So if the inventory is open, we need to go ahead and do a little bit of a check. So on here, straighten this out a little bit. 
we need to do a something after the branch. So after this branch, we're continuing to do this from false, but we need to drag output out a little bit. And we need to do a do once. So from false, drag off and do a search for do once. And then we need to do a sequence from completed. Drag off and, of completed and do a sequence. This first one will go into this output else just fine. So the first time you do a jump, it will do this. Uh, the second time, what we want to do is do a delay. So drag off of then one and do a delay. We want to do this for 1.1 seconds, or you could go and look at what your jump animation is. Maybe fine tune this a little bit more, but we're going to do 1.1 just for the tutorial or for this guide. From completed, I want you to drag that all the way over uh, to reset and then double click on the line and let's make this clean up a little bit and easier to see. Okay, so we've got on here it, the first time it goes through, normally uh, does a delay because it, it did a do once. It only allows you to do it the first time. And after this delay, it then resets it and lets it do it again. So that's a pretty simple little fix, but because it does this check during the jump process, this does allow it to, to prevent doing jump a second time too quickly. So go ahead and close all that out. And let's move on to the add crafting recipe required actor filter. Uh, what this does is it actually goes through and filters out the recipes that you don't need. Uh, so when you hit inventory, hit I uh, in the initial screen, if you don't have uh, items that you can craft, it just doesn't display them. It only shows you the craftable items. So what we need to do is go to the crafting menu. And in the left-hand side here, make sure you have content selected because it's not going to be under ALA, ALS here, B3. Uh, under content, search for crafting menu. And you'll just see a BP crafting menu. Open that up. Make sure you're in graph. So click on the upper right-hand side. And then on the upper left, search for populate You'll see populate crafting list. Double click that. I'm already in there. But what we need to do is add some things to the logic. So let's go ahead and find the section really quick. And it's right here. I'm going to zoom out so you can see. In this, right around here, kind of uh, over, uh, over a quarter of the way from the left. And you'll see is crafting filter, category of filter equal equals to all. What we need to add a, a decent amount of things here. So we're going to want to drag some items to the left to create some space. So drag your comment box out and then drag all the way to these two boxes that are one above each other and drag those all the way to the left. So now we have a decent amount of room. We may have to drag it more, but we'll start with this to begin. What we want to do is from this first branch, so make sure you're in one that looks just like this, it has the equal equals to all. Drag off of that true, and let's do a branch. From there, we need to actually first make a variable because we don't have this variable that's going to be checking at the moment. So click the plus variables on the left-hand side and call it filter out actor required recipes. I'm taking out the spaces there, just to follow because I generally do. And drag that to the condition box. Uh, we need to do compile because we want this to be true by default. And then check that box. So now uh, we've checked this box. We have it checking the branch, but we don't have this branch really doing anything. We are going to reduce some logic uh, from this uh, second branch that's down here. It, it, so it's actually going to drag into this first branch. So rather than go all the way to the right here, we're going to drag. So drag off a true of the bottom one. 
Uh, and either you can drag it in the line here, or I'm gonna double click on the line and give it an entry point. Drag true to there. And you can see it just goes straight up to it. And I'm gonna straighten this out a little bit. One trick, I actually wanna show you a trick really quick. Now this is straight, but let's say that that was up there. If I select it and then I control click an item to the left that I want to align it to, you can hit Q and it automatically lines that up. So that's a nice quick way to be able to uh, line up nodes and lines. So let's go ahead and add now the rest of this logic. So that's done from the left hand side there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and change one thing though. We want this true to go false. So if it's false, we then continue. So control click and drag that down to false and it's going to continue. It's going to continue over and, uh, and, and connect there. Now from the true, let's drag off and we're going to do another branch. Let's go ahead and create the logic now that we used to, to determine what this branch does. So first we'll need to do a get array crafting recipe list. From that, we're going to break it. We can get what type of things are stored in that. And at the very bottom, you'll see required actor. Drag off of that, and we're going to do a search for length and put length there. And then you can hit the up arrow and shrink that back down so it doesn't take up all that room. So now what we want to do is from length, we want to make sure that it's greater than zero. So we're making sure that it actually has something in the in the list. So on here, drag off of that and search for greater than, and it's greater inter, integer greater than integer. It looks just like this. Drag that into that condition. So now we have all of these connected in a line, connecting to this branch. Now uh, to to make this nice and clean. I'm going to double click and make another node right here. Straighten this out really quick. There we go. And then from false, drag from false into that node. So if it's false, it's going to go back into the main logic. Straighten that up. Okay. So now we have false continuing to go on, on the normal branch. Uh, the first one's false goes to the right. Through, we're going to make another branch. Go and drag off of that, do a branch. Now the false from this branch will once again go into this other one. So you can double click, but let's wait because we need to see how much room we're going to need at the beginning of this. So let's go ahead and start with the very beginning of it and type a get for array crafting List you, and it's going to be doing the same thing. So if you want, you can click that and then do a break. Or what we can do is because it's going to be the exact same item here, we're just going to highlight these two, the array crafting list and the break. I'm going to hit control C. I'm going to control V that to the left. Off of this, once again, we need to expand it and get the required actors. We're going to drag off and do a contains this time. So make sure see if it contains a certain item rather than get the length of it. Because this first one is just checking to make sure there's something in the list that actually contains a, an item. And now we're going to see if a certain item is in that list. So first, this is going to be just the, uh, this is going to be just the overall list. But we need, we're going to check it for one particular item. So on the, below those nodes you just added, do a right click and do a get inventory component drag from that and get get interacted actor and from that drag off and do a get class so we're going to get the class of the interacted actor that will tell us which item it is we're going to do that into the contains and it's only going to check is that item that we're interacting with does it exist in this crafting list. If it does, it is going to do a true. So I'm gonna go ahead and 
clean this up a little bit. Okay, so now from that contains, drag that into that branch. And then from this false, we need to connect this. Actually, we, need, we, we don't need to connect this false. I was wrong on the beginning there. Uh, because if it's false, we're not going to do anything. But if it's true, we want to connect back into this node. So go ahead and just double click, drag from true, and connect it in there. And see, we have a nice clean. That actually looks very nice. So this will now do a check, see if it's in there, and then continue on. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to highlight all of this. Drag it to the right. Okay, so that should be completed for that section. But we do need to go and make some adjust adjustments here really quick. In the crafting menu, so we're still in the same place, we need to go to the event graph. So on the left-hand side, expand graphs and double-click event graph. We need to add a new event. So just in a blank area here, I'm just going to do it below in this empty section. I'm going to do custom event. And we're going to add a custom event. I'm going to call it update crafting list. You can leave the settings as default here. Then we're going to drag off of it and get a populate crafting list. So just type populate crafting list. You'll see here, you can leave that as all. So all crafting categories. Now leave that as it is. We need, now need to go into the HUD. So go ahead and hit compile and save really quick just to make sure in case something crashes that we are going to be just fine. And then in the showcase, make sure you have content selected to the left. Do a filter for inventory HUD. Open up that inventory HUD. And then we need to be in the graph, and then event graph. Double click that event graph to the left. Go to an empty section. I'm just going to go right here. Uh, I've been a, so I'm still staying in that block. Right click and do custom event. We're going to add a custom event. And this custom event, it's going to be called update crafting menu. So type update crafting menu. Leave the rest of the settings as default. Drag off of that. And first we need to do a update crafting list, but it won't be, it won't be in here correctly. So it's, it's actually needs to refer to the uh, crafting menu variable. So right click and first do a get crafting menu. And now when you drag off, you'll be able to do a update crafting list because that exists in that crafting menu. So connect those up. Now we need to go into the player inventory component. So this, uh, we're gonna, we need to call this. Currently it's not being called. So let's go through and add something so that this actually gets called because at the moment it's just, just an event sitting here that isn't really doing anything. So let's, in the showcase, make sure you have content, search for player inventory component. Open that up. Let's be in the event graph. So just make sure you double click event graph on the left. Then in the blue section here, we need to find the client set event interacted actor. What you can do to do this is in the upper left, just search for client set interacted. And you'll see that it will then take you, if you double click on it, it'll take you directly there. And we just need to drag this to the left a little bit because we need to add some things after. First, let's get that reference to that variable, that HUD. Uh, so right click and do a get in inventory. And we want to do a get inventory HUD. 
from that, let's drag off and do update crafting menu. That's the one we just created. We're going to call it. So now when it, something is interacted with the client set interacted actor, it will then try to update the crafting menu. So now when you open up your inventory without interacting with the crafting bench, it will show you only the recipes you can craft. Uh, once the interact, once you interact with the crafting bench, if you show uh, the bed and the furnace and this, those different recipes in there, uh, those will show in the crafting bench. They will not show in your general inventory when it shows the crafting list. Go ahead and compile and save. Let's do a compile and save. Make sure everything is up to date. And then you can close out because we are done with that section. Now this next one is a little bit more difficult. Do go and do a save all really quick, just in case. Uh, the next one refers to some assets that are in the uh, shooter game demo from Epic. And what I've done is I've actually pulled all those out and made them nice and organized. And I'm going to include those in the YouTube videos description here so that you can download those and not have to go through all the work of pulling those together. So go ahead and double click. Uh, once you've downloaded it, open up impacts. You should see the file there. Right click on your content and do show and explore. You should see the box that says Advanced Locomotion V3, if that's the one you're using, or maybe just Survival Game Kit. Drag impacts into the general folder there. It then should be added next to the rest of those folders. And close that. And now, impacts are listed here. So you will see there's an impact decal, which is a bullet hole. There's a blood impact which will spray some blood off of the player when you hit them. And then there's like a bullet impact that kind of kicks up some dust that will be listed. So let's go ahead and to get these implemented, we need to first go into the master weapon. Go in the left content, do a filter search for master weapon and open that up. And in here, we need to create a new physical surface uh, variable. So Click plus variable, and we want to name this. Uh, we'll call it. Okay, we want to be. This is going to be an emitter. So let's go ahead and call this surface emitter. Now the type we need to change. So this surface emitter. Hit the drop down where it says boolean or whatever it says right now, and type e physical. And you'll see e physical surface. Now here on the right, we need to change that, the type. We need to make it a map. It brings an extra option here to the right where it says integer. You need to hit the drop down there and let's do a search for particle. There we go. The particle system. See at the very bottom, it just says particle system and select that. Let's compile and save this so it creates it. And now we'll need to go in and add some code to the event graph. So make sure you're in the event graph. Just double click that on the left and you'll see the red section here. I'm going to drag the existing code up to the right, up to the top. And then we need to create a new event. So go ahead and right click in the red section, do custom event. To add a custom event, we're going to call this multicast spawn hit emitter. This custom event needs to have some particular settings, though. But we need to have it to where when you select it in the upper right where it says replicates, hit the drop down and do a multicast. And this will say now executes on all. I go ahead and check it as reliable as well. And so when we call this, first of all, we're going to call it and it will show everybody this emitter uh, because that is something that 
if you didn't do this, it would only show on the local player. Uh, we want it to have it to where when somebody shoots a weapon and the emitter hits, that it will send that to everybody. So to do this, now we'll need to create a hit result first that it's passing along. So under inputs, go ahead and hit plus. Span that out and you'll see a new param. Call it hit result. In the drop down, hit the drop down there and type hit result. Now we can drag off of hit result and we can break that because we want to pull some particular information. What this does is gives you the information of when you hit something, uh, first of all, the location, where it impacted, what the material of the, the item that you hit the bullet, for instance. Uh, it will pull all that information. So we need to start making some things from this. So from that multicast, drag out and let's do a branch. And then we will need to first check on the physical material. Uh, so from this physical material, drag off to a get surface type. And then we'll want to drag out this surface emitter, drag that onto the screen and do a get. From this, you want to drag off of the surface emitter and do a find. And then connect that surface type to the find. So now what it's going to do is look for, does this surface in the list of surface emitters that we're going to have, does the surface that we hit exist? And if it does, uh, we'll drag off of this find and make this branch true. We'll make a decision based off of that. Uh, now, now we need to do a little more checking here. Uh, so first we need to make another copy of the surface emitter. So hit control C and then control V. We need to do a drag off of this and do a find. We want to find and then select default and then drag off of that find and do a select. So there's the first option. Uh, now you won't see the options, the correct options, because it doesn't know what the index is yet. We need to drag off of this Boolean for find, drag that into the index, and now it's going to give you a true false. So if it's false, it is going to use the default surface emitter. Uh, if it's true, it's going to use the impacted surface emitter. So if it found the surface type in the list, it's going to use that instead. From the true, drag off and do a spawn emitter at location. Go ahead and connect up the return value from the select up to the emitter template. We also need to Go ahead and set the location because we need to say where this spawn is going to happen because right now it'll happen at zero 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 so like it'll happen at the center of the map and that's not what we want so the impact point we need to drag off of impact point and drag that all the way to location you can double click on the line clean up and remember i'm just selecting full clicking and hitting Okay, so now we have the logic that it's doing a check here. If, if, if it finds it, it selects it. If it doesn't, it does the default material. And it only does that, it only spawns something if it is able to find the material. So uh, this seems kind of strange to me, the, the logic of this. This is based on his default uh, just because Let's think about this for a second. If this is false, will it ever reach here? No, it won't. <laughs> so I don't know why he has the default one here. Uh, this branch here is almost, almost kind of pointless at this point, but we're continuing to, we're going to keep how he has this, uh, and then we'll fix it a little bit later because I just, I don't see, I don't see how this, if it's ever false, it will never actually spawn an emitter. It'll never spawn the default emitter. I guess that's the logic that you want. You want it to where it doesn't always spawn things, correct? But if uh, following this logic, 
what you could do is just drag this straight into the emitter template. But that's fine. We'll leave it how he's done it in his, his example. Uh, and then we will continue on. So next, what we need to do is call this because currently this is not going anywhere. Uh, so what we need to do is first go, we need to be in the master ranged weapon now because that is the one that's going to be calling this event. So go to showcase and you should have here content and then master weapon. If you still have that in there, you can just double click that master range weapon. You need to, on the left hand side, search for weapon trace. Double click that under functions. And then we need to find where it says, does hit, does the actor, uh, hit actor implement interface. We're going to add something right after this branch here, but we need to base it on this out hit. So drag from the out hit of that line trace and then search for multicast spawn hit. And this is the one we just created, the multicast spawn hit emitter. Control click and drag the true to the right side, connect those back up. And you can double click and route that around a little bit. So that first one, uh, that's going to spawn it. Uh, and let's look when it's doing it. So if it's a single shot, it goes to the first one. Uh, if it's a, for instance, a shotgun might do multiple traces, or if you have something that's shooting more than one uh, pellet or bullet, then you would, it would go down to the second one. So you need to go to the second below where it says, does hit actor implement interface. What we can do though, to save some time is just click that, uh, multicast. We just put in there, hit control C and control V it down there. Control click and drag from the true, connect that in and then drag the out hit to the hit result. We're pretty much doing the exact same thing that we just did. Okay. So we now have both of those multicasts being called. Go ahead and compile and save that. Next, we are going to need to, now it, you, know, you may get an error and I'll tell you why really quick. So it's saying, could not find this function. The reason, go back to the master weapon because I haven't compiled and saved this yet. So when it's referring to it, it doesn't see it correct. So I'm going to compile and save the master weapon. I'm going to go back and compile the range weapon. And those errors will go away. Go ahead and close all these other menus. Do a fix up redirectors and the save all. Now what we need to do is go through and make a change to the project settings. So hit edit project settings. You need to go to the physics category, scroll down to the bottom and where it, the surface type one is, you need to type there body because this is going to be uh, blood. For instance, if you have other ones already listed here, we can refer to those. Uh, I wouldn't go through and delete them and add just this one. Uh, if you've been adding materials already, uh, you could, whatever you consider blood, you just need to remember that that's the one we're referring to for this. So this one will have his body and then we will have a default for this demo. Go ahead and close that. You'll have to, it will not show it initially. So we're going to have to actually close the whole engine and reopen it for it to detect that change in the project settings. Now in, once you've gotten, gotten into the project, go under survival game kit, go to materials, and we want to create a new folder underneath the materials, right click and hit new folder. All this physics material. In here, we're going to right click and we're going to create a new, like, and you'll see physics there, physics material. Select the physics material there and hit select and then call this pH underscore body. 
I'm going to select it and hit Control C and Control V, make another copy. Second one, I'm going to click and I'm going to rename to ph underscore default. Now what we'll want to do is double click an open body. And you'll see the surface type. You can hit the drop down there and select body. So this will be the material that then uses that entry that we put in the project settings. Save and you can, you can close that. So now what we want to do is we're going to be using these impact effects that we've added to the files and make sure you have those downloaded and entered into here. So you have these three, uh, I went through and actually organized these a little bit differently. If you do a migrate from the original project, like the instructions, these will be across a whole bunch of folders that will create in your project. I put them all underneath of an extras folder, uh, just organized them and made it to where it's much cleaner. So what we want to do is go to the master character. So select content. Search for master character. Double click and open that. You have all these hit boxes here. So there's the head hit box, all the way down to the arm hit boxes. I want you to click the top one, hold down shift and click the bottom one. So they're all highlighted. And what we're going to do is drag down to the right hand side and you can see physical material override. Hit that drop down and select body. Because we want it to where if you hit a player, blood will fly out rather than a puff of dirt and smoke. So now uh, you can compile and save that. Now we're going to go in and actually make it to where these effects show up with the weapons. So to do this, we need to be under content, search for rather than master, rather than master character, search for master weapon, and then open up the generic master weapon blueprint. In here, we need to go in and create a variable. Uh, we have this variable called surface emitter. So that is, that is ready to go. Uh, and then we also need to go in and set the category on this just to make it easier. So it goes in with the rest of these, you can type weapon settings up here, or you can click and drag that to weapon settings. And now it's underneath all of the files for survival game kit. Now that we have all of the surface emitter things created, we can go ahead and get started on the decal. That will be the bullet hole that shows up on various items when you shoot them. So to begin this, we'll go ahead and first we need to create the variable for it. So click plus variable. We'll go ahead and call this surface decal. For the type, we need to hit a drop down under variable type. Select E, physical surface. Again, hit the little icon to the right. Select map. The drop down to the new box that shows up. And on here, be careful to type material interface and select that. Uh, make sure you don't do material instance or anything else. It needs to be material interface. Uh, once again, you can uh, go ahead and compile that really. You 
can drag that up into the weapon settings or hit the drop down here or just type weapon settings there. So that this allows us to go ahead and continue and add the decal. So to do this, we're going to, first of all, let's do an, a drag off of the impact normal. I'll drag that the right here, just underneath of the spawn emitter and search for rotation from X vector. That right below it. You can double click on the line and straighten that out. So it's a little easier to follow. And then from the surface type, we need to drag off of that. We need to do a find. Now let's see if this will work correctly the first time from surface decal. Click that, drag it over to the top of that find. There we go. Now we have a surface decal. So move those over. So they are right below the uh, that X vector we just created. Double click on the line and you can straighten those out as well. Clean up your board. So from here to the left, that should be all correct. Uh, one thing we will do is drag something from this location item right here. First, we'll go ahead and straighten out some of these nodes. So first I will select control click view. All right. And you'll notice the surface emitter, the default here had changed since we went in and added in the project settings, a new uh, setting. It resets that list because now we have body as an option as well. So we've completed the emitter and now we can get started on the decal. So to do this, let's go ahead and first do an is valid because we're going to do an is valid check to not continue forward if there is no decal. From this find, let's go and drag that up into the is valid. That's the check that we'll be doing. You can go ahead and double click to add a node there, a reroute node because we're going to have this go over to a spawn decal at location. So right click and do a spawn decal at location. This is valid, we'll connect into that. You can double click on this line, straighten that out so it looks nice. We'll need this, remember I had double clicked and created a reroute over here for this location. Click and drag that over to the location on the spawn decal at location. Double click and you can reroute that along the top. Just double click on the lines. There you go, that adds that. Uh, then we'll need the rotation. So I had brought in this X vector rotation, drag that over to rotation there on the right. So that's the way that the decal will face. So we'll want that to go in and it'll just based on where the bullet hits and the direction it's coming from, it will rotate that bullet to be in the correct place. You want to set the lifespan. Let's do it to five seconds for now. Uh, his demo shows three. You can put three if you want to be exact, but I want the bullets to stick around for about five seconds. Then we'll need to set the decal size. So the bullets for the texture that we're going to be using, uh, three by three by three is an acceptable size for that. Uh, the decal material, uh, that, so... Since I dragged this off of this instance over here, it did a default and it didn't put the right one. So you need to control click and drag from that world context object to the decal material. Then you can right click and do a refresh node, refresh that, and that'll go away because we don't want that extra setting there. Let's take a look. Uh, this looks fairly complete. One thing we haven't done is actually set these emitter settings. So what we'll need to do is hit the plus. So first click the surface emitter. I want you to go to the surface emitter on the right. It says zero map elements. You need to hit, hit the plus there. And the first one will be default. So that's going to be P underscore default. Uh, then you'll need to hit, actually we can't, I take that back. We can't do default first because when you try to add a second one, it will say default already exists. So this one needs to be body, then P underscore blood. Uh, then do a plus, then you'll have default. Then you can do that one as P underscore default. 
compile and save that. Uh, now go ahead and click the surface decal. So get, hit plus there. The default decal we will want to be, uh, hit the drop down and search for impact. And then it's M underscore impact underscore decal. Pile and save that really quick. So this should uh, implement the decals. We can go ahead and hit play. Let's go ahead and play this and then go grab a gun and see if this is showing those. Now it's not showing the decal just because I think there is an instance of how we have this set. But we'll have to double check on that where we're actually calling those from because we have our surface types, we have our surface decal. Uh, default is what it should be hitting initially, uh, but it's not showing the impact. So we will have to Try that again really quick. I just want to double check and make sure. You notice I hit my foot. Uh, we don't have damage to yourself, but the blood's coming off of myself because I put body for mine and then it is having uh, that kick up happening of the dirt and the sparks from hitting various materials. So very good. Um, I'll have to take a look here in a second. Let's see why it's not spawning because that location is correct. It should spawn it on the item. With One thing we can do to test this is to do a quick print string here. And then what we will do is we can leave that duration to zero. I'm going to have the decal go into there. Just want to see if it shows the name that we're wanting to hit. Yeah, is showing the impact decal. So let's make sure that, yeah, that's the right one. So we'll, I'll double check that. Well, uh, before we're done here, I will make sure because I'm not seeing the setting that is incorrect, but uh, that I'll, I'll have to double check all my settings and make sure that it's not something that I have done because it should be showing that impact decal here. So we know that the name is correct of this. It is finding the correct, correct M underscore impact decal, but it is not actually spawning that decal at the location. So we'll come back to that and just make sure that something isn't quite, you know, not right in this whole list of things. So, all right, let's do the last of the features that were added on here. Uh, and this is for melee weapons. We want it with melee weapons that it actually plays an impact as well. So to do this, we're going to have to go back to the main screen here. And you'll want to open up. And so on the left here where it says search folders, we want to go ahead and open up the melee weapon. So if you just search for master melee and make sure content is chosen. You'll see master melee weapons. Open that up. And then we'll want to go to the section. So if the left here search for give damage once. In there, we're going to be adding some things towards the end. So we have on here this client uh, update inventory, just each of these three sections. 
we're going to need to pull that hit result. So right click somewhere and type get hit result. From that, we'll drag off and we're going to call the event with that we created earlier. And that is the multicast spawn hit emitter. Connect that up then select them. Both of those th that we just added, hit control C and paste them at the end of the other two sections. So now we have both of these uh, here done and this one are done. So those should call and spawn an emitter when you hit something. Uh, but we need to add another item here in the master melee weapon on the settings. So if we go to the class defaults right up here at the top, you have your surface emitter and you have your weapon system. You just need to make sure that you don't have this impact selected there because you don't want a bullet hole when you're hitting something with an ax, right? So if you select the impact decal, you can hit clear and it'll set it to none. Uh, you probably don't want smoke and sparks and everything else. Uh, you, you can decide that I, it, I don't think it would look right if you're hitting things in this other one or coming off as well. So what you can do is select the default one and hit clear is there, there as well. Uh, this will make it so that it will not do anything. It won't play anything. Uh, another option would be to delete it. Um, I'll go ahead and do that. We'll delete that one. You don't have to. You can hit clear and it won't play anything, but I'm just going to delete it. So it only shows for body blood. So if you hit somebody, blood will splatter off of them uh, and then it won't show a bullet hole. So that's the features that they've added. Now we're going to go through and do a couple fixes that they've done to mostly uh, the aim down sights location for the various weapons. So let's close this master melee weapon. Under content, we're going to do another search under filters and search for M1982. You'll see this BP underscore M1982. We want to open that up. And now we're going to need to do a search. Under the search details, search for camera location. You see these numbers? First, we have this location, this 29200. That's, it should be roughly the similar to this. Uh, what we want to do is on the last one, the Z, we need to change that. We'll make that negative 15.8. The rest of these numbers are close enough. They should be fine. We'll hit compile and save there. And then go ahead and close it. The next one we're going to do is the M4A4. So if you, on the search, you M4A4, double click the BP underscore M4A4. Same thing, we're going to search for camera. We have these numbers here. And what we will do is once again, just change the Z because the Z seems to be the one that's kind of messed up in these. Uh, we don't need to change the other settings. We want CAN ADS 24.05 equivalent 17, but this is negative 9.85. We'll change that to negative 9.85, compile and save that. And then you can close it. Uh, so now let's go through, there's an aim offset for aiming down sights that we need to add an extra couple of blueprints to. This is going to be in the master range weapons. So instead of M4A4, search for master range weapon. Open that up. And then we need to be on the screen trace. So in the left-hand side here, search for screen. We'll see screen trace. Now on the left of this, you have the get camera and trace start location. We're going to add some nodes just to the right of these first number of variables that are here. So if you want to highlight all of these just to the left of the get world location, and then drag those to the left. Then from this 
select, the first select, we're going to drag off and do another select. So drag, right click, do select. Uh, what we're going to do is get the player inventory component. So right click and do a get player inventory component. From that, we're going to get whether or not they're aiming down the sites. So do a get ADS. So now they're aiming down the sites. And that's going to be the index. So th these are the, going to be the options. Are you aiming down sites? True. Or are you not aiming down sites? Go ahead and line that up. You can put this right here. Uh, and this return value, go ahead and drag that into the get world lo location. Now true, what we're going to do is pull from this master character that's over here on the left, drag off of that and do get ADS camera. Scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a component for that, get ADS camera. I'm just going to line these up a little bit so they're nicely stacked. Okay. And drag that ADS camera into false, or sorry, into true. So the, you can double click on that and rearrange these a little bit. So they're lined up a little bit better. I'll actually move, I'm going to move this down below so they're not crossing over. It just makes it a little easier to read. So now we have the ADS camera. If it's not aiming down sights, it will uh, use third person, the third person camera. If it is aiming down sights, it will use the ADS camera. So that fixes that issue. Go ahead and do a compile and save. And then you can close the master range weapon. You can also save the master weapon and close that. Now let's fix an issue that has to do with harvesting. So when you're harvesting the bushes, uh, there's some settings that have been tweaked on there. So the content, we're going to search for bush resource. Double click that blueprint. Under the interaction brush, we want to hit the dro drop down arrow there and select a different icon because we have T underscore E underscore interact. Uh, we're going to change the size of this icon to 48 by 48. So it uses up more of the space. For the harvest, you leave that the same. The bush, we're going to set the interact timer to five. And then we're going to check the box for use interact timer. The rest of these settings can stay the same. So now there will be a countdown for when you are harvesting from a bush. Uh, but we need to go through and make a few changes to the in player inventory component to detect when the key is down. So go ahead and we're on the main screen there under content, search for player inventory component. Then in the event graph, so just double click on the event graph to the left, scroll out, and we need to find Close interact menu. So what you could do is just on the lower upper left, search for close interact, and you'll see close interact menu. Double click on that. That takes you right to the place that we want to be. And here we want to add a variable. We want to set a variable here. And the, the variable that we're going to set, we need to create first. So click variables and hit plus and shoot and enter in interact E down, hit compile. And then we'll drag that just to the right here of the close interact menu. Uh, what we're going to do is set that to false whenever we close the interact menu. So drag it out there, hit set, then do a control click and drag. And we will make it so that it goes from interact menu to setting that variable, then to the stop interact timer. So it should look something like this. Now this, since we're setting it to false, there's most likely a place that we're going to set it to true. So to find this, 
we need to go into the upper left and search for interact line trace. And you can see here on the event graph, top one. Then under if inventory actor open gate, we want to add, drag this client interact to the left a little bit because we're going to add a set there. So drag off of the right side of client interact and do a set interact key. And then you'll see set interact key down. And we're just going to put that in between, but we're going to check that box. So make sure that box is checked. So when you go to interact, it's going to then mark the interact key is down. When you close it, what we did previously, it then unchecks that and say, okay, the interact key is no longer down. Currently, there's nowhere that's actually checking this. So we're setting a variable that's kind of pointless at the moment. So let's make it so that we're actually checking uh, in the process of interacting with the bush, whether or not that key is down. So we're still going to be in this player inventory component, in the event graph, in the interact line trace, but we need to go to the very end here and we're going to add some logic. So we have close gate. What I want to do is drag that down and to the right a little bit. From the right of this server interact line trace, we're going to make a branch. So go ahead and drag off of there and type branch. What we're going to be checking is that inter interact key down. So either you can go to the left here and find that and drag it out, or you could drag off of this and search for it. I'm just going to drag and drop it onto the condition. And then there's the interact key down. This close gate, I'm going to have that run later, but I want it to run based on false. So control click and drag that down to false. And then let's add some logic to the true. So right click and do a get last hit. And then from this drag and do a cast to interact. And so we have here cast to interactive foliage actor and select that connect true to the beginning of that cast. And then from the cast failed, we want to cast that to the cast to BP underscore master resource. So you see cast to BP underscore master resource. So if it fails, it'll go to that. We're going to connect that also to last hit. And then I'm going to do another of this close gate. Uh, this is actually going to go all the way to the right of that. So what I can do is just double click and make it so I can reroute it there, drag it to the right, and then we'll have this cast failed go into this close gate. So at this point, it should look like this. Uh, we're going to drag off of the cast to interactive foliage actor, and we're going to do a close gate there. So you can drag off and just do close gate. From the cast to master uh, resource, we're going to drag that and also connect it to that close gate. So if it's, if both either of these are successful, they're going to come up to this close gate and then they're going to do a few extra steps. First, we're going to delay. So drag to the right of that close gate and do delay. We're going to make the delay 0 0.1, 0 0.1 seconds. And then we're going to call client interact. So drag off of completed and then do client interact. So select close gate, delay and client interact, hit C, that'll bring up a comment. And what this is doing is if the interact E is down, run interact again. The can interact key is not down. It will close the gate and it won't run it again. So that is the logic. Uh, and that should fix it for collecting the resources. Uh, the final issue that for the world things like this that we're going to fix, there is one more sound issue we'll do right after. But the doors, the doors are not 
uh, opening for clients when you're doing multiplayer. So if someone logs in after, uh, you will notice that the doors don't match up. For some one person, a door may be open. For another person, a door may be closed. And so we want to go through and actually sync up these doors so that when a new player logs in, they both see a door is open or they both see a door is closed. So go ahead and let's start off by closing this player inventory component. You may want to compile and save that. I'm going to save all. And then I will fix up redirectors and we should be good with that. In the content, let's do a search and let's find the wood door build part. And this is part of the base building. On this, we're going to go into the event graph. So just you can double click and make sure you're in the event graph. And then in a new section, you can just do it. We could do it to the right of the rest of this content. I'm going to create some events. So we'll need to do a right click and do custom event. We're going to call this server set starting rotation. This is one that's going to execute on the server. So you're going to right click or go to the right side, hit the drop down and choose run on server. Choose reliable. And now we're going to cast to another event, but that event that we're casting to isn't created yet. So let's create it below. Right click and do another custom event. And then do this one as multicast. Set starting rotation. Uh, this one is going to be an executes on all. So hit the drop down and choose multicast and make that reliable. Well, one thing we're going to be passing to this one though is the rotation. So you'll need to make sure multicast is selected, hit plus on the inputs, all that new input rotation, hit the drop down and choose rotator. Now we'll be able to go in and call this. So first there's door static mesh on the left, drag that out for the reference, drag off of that and get relative rotation. And you'll see get relative rotation. And then drag off of the, the server set starting rotation and do a multicast set starting rotation. This will connect that rotate relative rotation to the rotation in that node. And what this is doing is this is going to execute. It's going to tell the server. There's a door that's open, you know, set, here's the, here's the amount that the door is open. It's then going to call the server. The server's, the server's then going to say to everybody on the server, Hey, this door is open. This makes it so everything passes through the server properly and people aren't each individually broadcasting a lot of things. So this is the proper way that you want to do it. You do this very same method when you're replicating, maybe footsteps, bullet impacts, all kinds of things. You could do it in this same manner. Let's go ahead and drag off of this multicast and we'll do a set relative rotation. But it's going to say for the mesh. So actually let's do one thing a little bit different from that. Let's get this door static mesh again, because that will narrow down the choices because there was a lot of them there. So from drag off of the left side into the uh, blueprints here, door static mesh. Now drag off of that and let's do set relative rotation. You can see there's a lot less options there. Connect the multicast to this, drag the rotation down. And now uh, we're setting that relative rotation. So this at the moment isn't being called. What we'll need to do is make it so that when a player connects that they call this and they're able to find out what the uh, amount of door, the door being open is. So to do this, you need to compile and save, and then close this building uh, wood building parts. Now we're in the main window under content, and search for BP underscore survival game mode. Now, if you're not using, one thing you want to double check with this 
is that you're using the survival game mode for your level because there's blueprints in here. And I went through with the previous fix video and I changed this, but this would be a good opportunity for you to verify that you have actually done all the fixes if you're using the ALS and SGK together and you're using the survival game mode. What you do is just switch it to the survival game mode for that game mode and make sure it says mannequin character or whatever your main character is. Uh, those are the two things that you'll need to check. Now we'll double click and open this game mode. And these actions are performed on login. So once the character has logged into the server, it runs these things. So we're going to add a few things to it to make it so that it actually checks those doors. So first, let's drag out a little bit to the left, that comment box, and we're going to move the event on post login to the left a little bit. This new player, I'm going to drag off of that. I'm going to choose promote to variable because we want to create a variable rather than having this reroute node go all the way around. Control click and drag so that it's passing through that new, uh, new variable. And let's change the variable name to new connected player, because this player is going to run this every time they connect. And so this is going to mark them as a, a new player. We will then delete this reroute node that's coming down below and delete it on the right hand side as well. You'll see to the left, the new connected player, go and drag that to the player controller on the very right hand node that's left over and then drag that below. So it's setting it here and it's pulling it here, uh, rather than doing one straight line through. So other than this, we're going to now add a few additional uh, blueprints that are being checked. So to do this, uh, we're going to first drag off of the right one here. And we're going to add a sequence because currently uh, it's going to go straight through this line. After this delay, we need to add a sequence. So select those left three options and drag them over a little bit to the left, enough to make a sequence here. If I'm completed, drag off and type sequence. And we'll go from then one. So drag on from then one and do a get all actors of class. Select that. And what we're going to be getting, you have to hit the drop down for actor class. We're going to be getting all those wood doors. So BP wood door build part. This is going to be looking for all the doors in the world. Uh, and it will make a list of them. So then out of out actors, we want to get the length of that because that's going to say how many doors there are. Uh, cause currently you know, getting a list of all the doors. Well, how many doors are there? Uh, we'll do a check drag off the right of that and do a greater than, so integer greater than integer, we're going to say, are these doors, or there's more than one? If there's more than zero doors, because it's not a greater than or equals, if it's more than zero, that means it's going to be one or more. So we're going to see a true false on this of, is there more than one? Is there a door or more? Drag off of the right side of that, uh, get all actors of class, and do a branch. This branch will be based on whether or not there is a door. If there is a door in the world, we're going to then do a for each loop. Uh, the array type is going to be this, all of these out actors. So drag that over, double click, and let's reroute this down below. What this is doing is for every single door in the world, because we've already checked to make sure there's more than one, you know, there's a door or more for every single door that there is it's going to do some steps and it's going to do this one time per door. Uh, so what we want to do is off of this, we want to drag that array element and we want to do a server that starting rotation. And so what this is going doing for the player is every time for each of those doors in your local client, it's going to open those doors, the amount that the server thinks they should be open. So that's what it's calling here. So let's go ahead and drag this over here, highlight them all, all the bottom ones, hit C, and we'll call this set door starting rotations. Okay. So now that is syncing up all the doors in the world 
Uh, so you shouldn't notice any cons inconsistencies when you log in. And you could do this with other things. I mean, this is doing it for the doors, but this logic is very similar. Uh, you could do this for anything else that may has a varied state in the world that you want to sync up between all the players. So go ahead and compile. Let's save that and then close. So now let's do the, this is the final of the 1.7 hotfixes. From content, let's do a search. And this is going to fix the issue with uh, the bullets when you're firing your weapon. The, the firing sound wasn't always firing from the gun. It was actually firing from various places uh, to the left of the players, what I usually noticed. So do a search for master range weapon. Open that up. And then on the upper left, or actually the very left, we need to do a search for client weapon effects. Double click on that. And in here, you'll see play fire sound. So this is doing a play sound out location. It's getting the actor location, not getting the gun location. Uh, and so that may not be totally accurate. What we're going to do is base it off of the skeletal mesh, and we're going to do spawn sound uh, attached. So first, what we'll do is drag out this weapon skeletal mesh. You'll see on the upper left, drag that out into the blueprints. I will then go ahead and delete this node right here. We'll just remember that it connects from here to here. Delete the get actor rotation or location. Then from this weapon skeletal mesh, drag off and do spawn sound attached. We'll then want to connect those nodes back up. Hit the drop down because there's a setting we're going to need to change. And then fire sound, make sure you connect that into sound because that's setting which sound it's going to play. Uh, for the drop down of the location type, hit the drop down and choose snap to target, including scale. So now we'll have a sound that will play at the location of the weapon. Some other things you can consider in the future is possibly doing at attenuation settings. One thing this will do is have the drop off of, you know, for distance, have some different sounds based on how close or how far away you are from that player. So that's a good place that you could uh, affect those. We don't have to play with any other settings. So you can minimize that down and bring that up a little bit. There you go. So that's nice and centered. We're going to be doing this a few other places, uh, still in the master range weapon. But we need to go and search on the left-hand side for client left mouse actions. Double-click that. And then at the very end here, you see this play sound at location. Well, we're going to replace that in a similar method. So go ahead and drag the weapon skeletal mesh out again. Delete the get actor location. Put that skeletal mesh right below the empty fire sound. And then I'm going to drag off and do spawn sound attached from the skeletal mesh. I'm going to control click drag from the sound at location down to the sound attached. And then I'm going to connect up the empty fire sound. Once again, we're going to hit the drop down and choose keep from creep out of offset to snap to target, including scale. The rest of the settings are fine. Oh, we'll just have leave that as is. And then there's one more place that we need to change. Still in the master range weapon in the event graph. But if you double click on it, you'll notice you don't go there. So you need to click the event graph up top. Now we have a place where it says multicast play sound. For me, it's in the lower left. We have a very similar thing that we've done before, the play sound at location. We don't want that. And we don't want this get actor location. So we're going to delete that. And we will delete the play sound at location. We're going to drag that weapon skeletal mesh in one more time. We're going to drag off of that and choose spawn sound attached once more. And connect that node back up, connect the sound back up, hit the drop down, and we'll do once again. Snap to target, including scale. And there we go.
we have made all of the changes. So that is completely uh, updated to the 1.7. We'll do a compile, save. We'll just do a quick run around, make sure everything is working. Just fire off a few shots. The one thing that isn't working is the decal. So after pausing for a quick moment, uh, I did notice that it is actually working. So let's go ahead. I'm going to show you really quick before I make a change that makes it a little more noticeable. Let's go ahead and pick up a weapon. I had to look at it at the right angle. Uh, it just was very faint and hard to see. So the bullet impact is working. Let's go and shoot directly down. Uh, it's very hard to see, but there is a faint mark on the ground. So I wasn't really satisfied with that. Let's go to the master weapon once again. I'm going to change the decal size to 444. Hit compile and save there. Hit play and let's try this. See there? That looks a lot better. That's much easier to see. It still is somewhat dependent on the angle, but you can see it is actually placing them on there. So, uh, that it is working. Uh, you could do probably some better bullet impacts. I mean, these are very faint. Of course they fade after five seconds. Uh, sometimes they seem like they're brighter than others. That would probably be all in that impact decal. So, from what I can tell, everything is working as intended. This is the 1.7 update. Uh, one thing we'll do to finish this off is go to the met level. And then over here, you'll see some text on the screen. We need to update the version number. So if you click on that version 1.6.3, go to details on the right, and then change in the text. 1.7. That way you always know what version you're currently on. And you, and you may, time should, may pass and you may forget exactly what version you're working on at the moment. And this will help you to always remember. If any of these things are wrong, you can always change this text. For instance, my inventory is with the letter I. You can change any of these to match whatever changes, or you could put whatever information you want there, but just make sure you use this as the place that you store that version number, because it would be easy for you to forget which one you're on. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you uh, like and subscribe and click the little bell to get notifications of new tutorials that I do. Uh, also, make sure you join our Discord. The link will be in the description for that. It's a place where we all hang out, ask questions, discuss game de development related topics. Uh, and it's a great place that you can go and meet other people that are like minded. Uh, I have a link to my Patreon if you want to help support by additional assets that I will do as future tutorials. And, uh, and also make sure you just make a comment and tell someone else about the channel. Uh, it'd be a, it, this is the best way that you could help me is to let other people know that I am making tutorials and help one of your friends out at the same time. So thank you very much, and I will catch you all later.